where do you go to for guidance in life? Like what, where, who, what is your source of advice, of wisdom? Kind of where do you go when you need to figure out what to do or how to do something? Um, my hope for you is that you have some person or peoples in your life who you can go to who can give you wide advice and guidance for all the things of life. Um, in fact, uh, I've been blessed to say that I have those people in my life. I have multiple people that uh, I've gathered over the years who I have deep relationship with that can give me advice when I need it that I trust. Um, but I'm just going to be a little honest with you. When I need to know how to do something, I often don't go to a person what I go to is just Google, right? I just go to Google because Google seems to have really the great answers that I need. Uh, a couple uh, Earlier this month, uh, uh, someone at our church, uh, a friend, someone uh, who's been attending our campus, uh, the Green Campus, or the, excuse me, now the ARC for a long time, she needed help. She was uh, at work. And while she was at work, her truck would not start as she was trying to leave. And so she called my wife and my wife was like, why are you calling me? Talk to Drew. He knows more about this than I'll ever know. And so as I'm talking to her, I help her out. I get her to the point where she gets her, her vehicle jumped. And then she goes and takes the truck to O'Reilly's, I believe it was, to get her battery checked to see if it was actually holding a charge, if that was the problem. And they ran some tests and they came back and they said, hey, it's not your battery. It's actually your alternator. They said it had this big crack in it and it wasn't doing its job right. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know enough about this. Uh, but the alternator ended up being the problem. But this was a problem for Faith because Faith doesn't know how to fix cars. Uh, and so she called me and said, hey, could you help me? It's going to be expensive. And I'm like, okay, I can help you. I, I have the, the basic skills to get this done. I, and, and I've replaced an alternator before. I kind of know what it takes. I know the tools you need. I got a socket set. I got wrenches. I got uh, screwdrivers. I, I know what an alternator looks like and what it is and kind of where it should be. And I know that you have to take off the belt to uh, replace it. But the truth is, I don't really fully know how to replace this alternator. Right? I don't know all the specifics. I don't know where all the bolts are and, and all the exact size of tools I need, but Google does. So I go to Google. I type in, how do I replace a 2007 alternator on F-150? And in like seconds, seconds, I'm in a video of this guy walking through step by step. This is how you do it. This is where these bolts are. This is where these connections are. This is the exact tool you'll need to do it, the size of pry bar you're going to need. And in an hour, Saturday morning in an hour, I start this project. I'm done. I'm wrapped up. The entire alternator's in. The, the belt's back on exactly where it needs to be. So when we start the engine... The belt doesn't fray and destroy it. Uh, everything's good to know. Google has the answers for me. And Google's a great tool, by the way. If you are looking for something like skill of how to do something, Google can be your best friend. As long as you have the basic school skills, like it can point you the way. And Google's great for that, but Google is not, not great for the real issues of life. I cannot go to Google and find help for the real things, the difficulties of life, the, the guidance of life that I need for the, for the real aspects of life and the real aspects of all of our lives. In fact, I went and checked this out. I went and I asked, I typed into Google, what is my purpose in life? And in 0.34 seconds, I got 12 billion results. 12 billion results on what is or how I'm to determine my purpose of life, which is not that is not helpful. 12 billion answers is not going to point me in the way I need to go. And besides that, I can't even believe that's true. How does Google have 12 billion answers when there's only 7 billion people on the planet? Uh, someone needs to check them. So where do you go for the real guidance, the real advice in your life? It can't be Google. So today we're continuing our series we're going to be looking through Exodus. Today we're looking at Exodus 18. We're continuing the series, This is Our God, where we're looking at who is God in the midst of the story of Israel in Exodus. And today we're, we're getting to the end of this series that we're going through. Next week's going to be the final one, chapter 19. Today we're in chapter 18. And just a quick catch up if you haven't been here for part of it or all of it. And I know it's been summer and Labor Day. People are out doing things, family. Uh, what's happened up to here? 
is God has called Moses to lead Israel, his people, out of slavery of Egypt. He's brought forth the 10 plagues. He's led them by a pillar of fire and smoke. He's brought them across the Red Sea that he's parted. He's crushed the Egyptians. They've praised him. There's been this moment where they don't have food. They don't have water. God has provided all of that. Then they go to war with the, Amal- <laughs> the Amalekites and they are, they're, they're victorious. And then this, like, this, this driving force in this story just kind of comes to a halt. This action that has been constant now comes to a halt because the people of God, the Israelites, have reached part of their destination, not the, the, the promised land, but they've, brought, they've come to Mount Sinai or Mount Oreb, a place that God has told them that they will come to worship him. And this particular chapter, just before we dive into it, just a a little thing to know, uh, up until this point, Exodus has been told in chronological order. It's just a story, one thing after the next. This happened, and this happened, and this happened. And today, actually, we kind of fast forward in the story. It's not chronological, as we'll see. And I I bring that up because you'll see it in the text. You'll see it next week. Hey, how did this happen before this? This jumps forward after they've arrived at Mount Sinai, likely after the Ten Commandments have been delivered and these like laws and statutes. This is a fast forward in the story that is written this way uh, to capture a thematic idea versus a chronological idea. And so let's get into it. Verse 1 of chapter 18, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land in the name of the other Eleazar, For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. So the set up the chapter, it's now this time Jethro, Moses' father-in-law is bringing his family, Moses' wife and two sons back to him. And, and, And what we see at the beginning though, is Jethro has been made aware of the goings-on of Israel and Egypt and Yahweh. News has reached him about what uh, God has been doing, the miracles that he's performed, who he is. And this is important because at the beginning of Exodus, as we're going into it, what we saw is God's desire through all of this isn't just to save Israel, although we don't want to discount that. It is true. He's a personal, intimate God who cares deeply for his people and, and, and fights for them. But there's also this higher level goal that he has. He desires to be known amongst all the people of the area, all the people of the world. And his plan is working. Because of what he has done through Israel, news has reached Jethro in Midian. This is about 400, again, 400 miles away. And he is hearing about the wonder and glory of God. This is amazing. Like, this is before the internet, before phones, before uh, planes, trains, automobiles. This is word of mouth. It's spreading across the region and, and, and the world that God, Yahweh, has defeated the Egyptians. He's defeated their gods. He's defeated Pharaoh. He is a powerful, mighty God. And people are taking notice. Jethro has taken notice. And it goes on. Uh, verse six, and when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. So we see this this reunification of the family, this Jethro and Moses coming out. And it just points to like this, this connection that they have. Moses comes out, this is family. He loves them. He has a bond with them. He greets him. He honors him. He's excited to see him. This is important for the advice that we'll see being given as we go farther into the chapter. But it's also this really cool point that that Jethro is saying, I've heard what has happened. I'm excited by what's happened. And and the particular way he's saying, he's not excited. He doesn't rejoice because of what Israel has done. He rejoices because of what the Lord has done, what Yahweh has done. 
he's coming to the realization that everything is happening isn't because of the might of Israel. It's because of the might of God. It's this, again, this gradual realization of who God is. And they have this, this, this conversation. Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. Mo, Jethro just says to Moses, like he's, he's, he's recognizing the greatness of God. And he kind of says it in this really interesting way. Uh, this, this translation is, a, it's, I guess, a really difficult part from Hebrew. And in the fullness of everything he's saying, he's actually pointing to the very specifics of what God did is allowing him and, and probably other people to recognize who God is. This, this dealt arrogantly with him. He's saying like, I, we have heard this story. We have seen how Israel was enslaved by this evil nation who piled work upon them, who, who would kill their, their sons by casting them into the Nile. And how God has turned that around on Egypt is catching the attention of that, that they took this economic powerhouse and he brings it to its knees by, by through the plagues, but also removing their slaves. He's, he's taken this evil that was done of killing their sons and he uses it in the plagues. He takes the Nile and he turns it in the blood. It was once a weapon uh, being used by Egypt and Pharaoh against the Israelites is now being used against Egypt and where they put the sons of Israel to death. God in his final plague takes the lives of all the firstborns of all the houses of Egypt. And it, it's catching the attention of everyone. And Jethro is noticing it and he's noticing who God is in this. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So out of respect, out of recognition of who God is and what he has done, he starts sacrificing. He starts having this meal. And it's not just like a breaking of bread with Moses and the elders. It's, this is a deeply religious meal that holds significance in, in the change that we'll see in Jethro. And we're going to come back to this. And then it goes into the second half of this chapter. And the second half is the chapter is the part I think most people who have been in the church uh, for any real amount of time are very familiar with. It's this part where Jethro gives really great advice to Moses, just really applicable advice to the situation he's in. And for myself, and I know a lot of people who have, who have discussed this with me, this is what uh, they've been taught from this passage. And I, I just want to say it's not, uh, it, it's good. It is good advice uh, but what we've set out to do in this series is not to look at all the like the little ways that we can live. We're not going to focus in on this, this advice that he gives. We want to look at the deeper part behind it, which is what does it actually reveal about who God is? So we're going to touch over this advice. We're going to touch on it, but we're going to come back through it and really see who God is in the midst of it. So verse 13 Excuse me, verse 13. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a dispute... They come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses, it's the next day Moses gets up, he does what he's been doing and Jethro just observes. He observes the going-ons of Israel, but particularly Moses. And what he sees brings forth this huge concern. He watches Moses from the moment he's up to the moment he goes to bed that all of Israel, remember three million people, just like parade their disputes and their issues in front of Moses. And Moses, with it sounds like a little bit of help, but mostly by himself, just as like the arbiter of all the issues of Israel. And as he's watching it, he's like, this is, this is not good. This is bad. He has true concern. At one point in my life, I'm very jaded, uh, immature self. I would I'll look at this and I'm like, man, Jethro is just kind of mean. He's like, why are you doing this? You're an idiot. You're a fool. I, I don't think that's true. I think what we see between them and their relationship, this is true concern for his son-in-law. 
he's watching them and he's like, this is, this is not going to end well. Because what is happening is Moses in this position of leadership, and, and, and this is what he's supposed to be doing. He is the excuse me, intermediary between Israel and God. What he is doing is he's taking this role and he's expanding it to the point where he is in this leadership role and is micromanaging every single individual issue that Israel has. And micromanagement isn't necessarily wrong when done in, in certain ways, but it is wrong as a leader to micromanage every aspect of something. And that is what Moses is doing. And he, I just got to look at him with pity and like he's got to be pulling his hair out. Because I'm a, I'm a dad. Uh, a lot of you have been parents or are parents. Uh, and, and you've lived this out. You have your kids, a couple kids, five, ten, whatever it is. You've lived this out where they come to you with every petty squabble. They present it to you. They want you to fix everything and, and decide who's right and wrong when everybody's wrong and everything's not going well. right? And it's, it's maddening. And he's doing this on just a national level, times a million everyone bringing their problems, just wearing Moses out. And I, I just, I feel for him in this moment. Jethro feels for him in this moment. And so it says, Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statues and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you. But in a small matter, they shall decide themselves. So it'll be easier for you. And they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure. And all this people also will go to their place in peace. Moses just lays, or excuse me, Jethro just lays it out for Moses. He just gives him some really just great advice. Just kind of addresses all the issue that he sees and how he's to move forward. And, and, and I don't want to dismiss it. Again, we want to look at who God is, but I don't want to dismiss this outright. This is really good um, advice. So just kind of the touch on it. He gives really three main things. The first one, he starts out with really calling into clarity Moses' role as the leader of Israel, or at least the leader under God of Israel. That he's to be their intermediary. He is to lead a nation of this three million people. He has a specific calling and he needs to live within that calling. And what he's doing at the moment is not living out that calling. It's blown up way beyond what he should be doing, what he can do, what anybody can accomplish. And then he gives him some more advice. He just lays it out. Here's a system in how you can handle all the disputes of Israel in carrying out your leadership. And, and, and it's... It's advice at this point that I think most of us are familiar with. It's used in the business world, church world, home world. It's used all over, right? This, this delegation of authority and responsibility says, all right, you're going to go ahead. You're going to take and you're going to find these, these men and you're going to put them over large groups and medium-sized groups and small groups. And they're going to handle all those issues. And when they can't actually handle them, only then, only then will you step in and intervene. And it really, the best I can describe it, it looks almost like our judicial system, right? There's the, there's the Supreme Court, which in this case is Moses. He's the ultimate authority representing God. He gets all the big cases. And under that, they have all these other uh, courts, the district courts, the appellate courts, the, the circuit courts, and then the, the state, the county, the, the city courts. And all the issues are to be handled at their local level and then slowly work themselves up until Moses is only uh, left dealing with the things that Moses should be dealing with. It's a good system, a system that is put in place all across the world in all aspects of our lives. And it's important for him. It's important for us. It's good advice. And there's one other piece of advice in the midst of this that he gives. He says, I want you to go out and I want you to gather these leaders, these men who are going to fulfill this role. And he gives really two things, two main things that he wants Moses to look for. He says, you're to go find able men. You were to find able men to fulfill this role. The first thing that are one of the things that he is to look for in finding men to lead this, these, uh, these, these parts of Israel is to find men who have skill. 
men who are capable of accomplishing the task. And, and I don't know exactly what that looks like, but men who can speak well, men who have good relationship with people who are, can put the laws and statutes of God into practice at a reasonable way, all of these things who make good decisions. He wants them to find the skills, people with the skill necessary. But then he gives a second half to it. He says, you're to look for men of skill, but you're also look for men of character. And he gives three really qualifiers. You're to look for men who fear God, who are trustworthy, and men who hate a bribe. He drives home. This isn't just about finding men in these leadership positions that are high, highly skilled, but it's about finding leaders who have high character. Both are necessary to effectively carry out really God's leading of the nation. It's a good rule for them. It's a good rule for us that as we put people in positions of leadership, really as you manage people and have them serve whatever you're leading, it's important that you search for both. One without the other will lead to, will lead to destruction. And, and I think Jethro is trying to drive that home for Moses. You have to find both. And I don't know if I'm reading too far into it, but he lists one time about skill and he lists three qualities beginning with a fear of God, but three qualities highlighting character. I think it's an important thing to remember that when we look for people in these positions, that character trumps skill. And I've seen it throughout history. I've seen it in my personal life. And I think a lot of you have too, that you can teach somebody a skill. You can't teach everybody every skill, but for the most part, a good teacher can teach people how to do most things. People are capable of learning and growing, but teaching someone with low character to have high character is a difficult, arduous task that takes a long time that can come at huge expense. And we see it, unfortunately, happen all across the world in, in business, in, in, in government, in the church. These people who have high skill and low character being put into positions. And they are often initially highly successful, but their success is usually only matched by their plummet because their low character will ultimately be their undoing. And so three really great pieces of advice, live in your calling, have this good system, search out men with both, our leaders with both high character and high skill, good advice. And it says in verse 24, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. So Moses gets the advice from Jethro. He implements it. It works out well. Jethro departs. He goes home having helped out Moses. Uh, and really, in this, Moses does get great advice. Like He is given great advice that actually works but we want to look to what is the greater thing happening in this story, greater than the advice. And interestingly enough, today it points to this idea that God is greater. God is greater. And it's sprinkled all throughout this, this, this chapter that in the midst of all that's going on, we keep seeing how God is greater than all the things happening. God is greater than all the, everything going on around. He's greater than the advice simply that's happening. He is the greater and the greatest thing happening. And so we see this in multiple places. The first one comes, the first one comes during Moses and Jethro's interaction, uh, kind of in that greeting time. And Moses shares all that has happened. He really fills uh, Jethro in on the, the parts of the story he may not be aware of. And Jethro's response in verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Jethro literally acknowledges that God is greater. And this is a really important part of Jethro's journey, his relationship with God. We see how the, it, because of what is happening, because of the story of Exodus, Jethro is being transformed. 
And Jethro, what we saw in, in chapter two and what we see at the beginning of this chapter, Jethro is a priest of Midian. And we don't have like this super great picture of Midian and all their gods and their ways of life, but we do know that they are uh, at some level pagans. They follow uh, false gods, these other gods that other uh, people at the time would follow. So he's a priest of Midian, which means he's a priest of these false gods. He's not a worshiper of Yahweh, at least prior to this. Now, there's some discussion of do they understand who Yahweh is? Probably they have some picture of it because of Moses's interaction when he lives there under his father-in-law. But this is a change. Jethro is seeing who God is and he's turning towards him. And there's a lot of debate. Is this the moment where Jethro is now fully on board? Is this kind of an acknowledgement of something else? Because the the wording's difficult. Is greater than all gods. Is this just Jethro, like this acknowledgement of of Yahweh amongst all these gods? Yeah, he's a God. He's the most powerful God, but he's still going to worship all these other gods as well. Or is this a true conversion? that Jethro is turning away from his false idols, all these gods, and turning to the one true God, Yahweh. And there's a lot of debate amongst this. There's a lot of people who do lean towards, what I lean towards, the teaching team leans towards, is that this is truly Jethro turning to God. He's acknowledging everything he sees. And, And I believe this, we believe this, because the evidence in Jethro's life seems to point to this true conversion. He is truly turning to God and acknowledging him as the one true God. What we see immediately following this, he offers sacrifice to God. He he has this this like God-centered meal. The advice he gives, he just keeps dropping God is in this advice. But beyond that, what we see from Jethro is the the long-term impact. At the end of the chapter, he returns back to Midian. And what we believe through scripture, what Jewish tradition would would tell us is he brings back, he brings back to Midian this belief in Yahweh. And the people, not all the people, but some of the people of Midian, they start turning to Yahweh because of the belief that Jethro has. He leads people to him, this one true God. And And in the future, in the Old Testament, what happens is this group of Midianites, the Kenites, they leave Midian. They become part of Israel. Jethro changes and out of his chains, he starts bringing other people to worshiping God. And and, and as we follow God, right, as we are following God in our lives, uh, we need to ask ourselves, is there evidence in our lives that that is true? Is there evidence in our lives that we are following God? Because there's a lot of things that we can follow in our life and really we can make that choice, but our actions can reveal something that we're, we're not intentionally following. We don't have like they did all these hundreds of thousands of gods all around that are worshiped. There are places in the world that happen in the U.S. That's not super common, but there are these idols that we have in our actions and the way we live provide evidence what God we're following. And sometimes it's money, our power, our fame, our lust, or on and on, whatever it may be. Does the evidence of your life point that you are following God? And if it's not, what do you have to do in your life to realign yourself, to follow what is greater? Because God is greater than all of those things. It's what Jethro is acknowledging and living a life that reveals. And are you acknowledging God's greatness and and living a life that reveals that you follow him? And then this idea of God and greater is greater. It continues on throughout the chapter. Next, we see it in this interaction between Moses and Jethro after he's given or he's, he's witnessed his, Moses' actions. He's expressed his concern. And he just asks Moses, why are you doing this? Like, what do you, you're, this isn't good. Why? But why? Why are you sitting around taking all the complaints of Israel upon yourself and deciding for them? And Moses' response reveals quite a bit. He says, because the people come to me to inquire of God. There's three people in the sentence, Israel, God, (laughs) uh, Moses. And the thing that Moses is allowing to drive how he lives out his calling in this moment, it's not God, it's Israel. Because the people come to me. That's what is defining how he is living out 
his calling to Israel to lead Israel. Israel now is in the driver's seat. They've said, hey, we want you to just sit there and resolve all our disputes. And Moses has now taken that upon himself and said, okay. He has a specific calling as intermediary that, that Jethro calls him back to. But in this moment, Moses is allowing Israel to define it. And it's not good for him. It's not good for Israel. It's not good because this isn't who he's made to be. It's not who he's called to be. And it's a good reminder for us of who are we allowing to guide us in our lives. Are we allowing God to be in control? Are we following his calling? Are we allowing the circumstances or the people in our life to dictate how we are living out our purpose? What Moses is doing, he's allowing the urgency of Israel to dictate how he lives. They need him to lead and he's following. And it's, it's a question we have to ask. Are you allowing all the, the, the things in your life drive forth your calling? Your calling is supposed to come from God, not the people around you or the circumstances around you. What are you looking to for guidance in your life? The second thing we see though is also Moses. Moses' reaction, his choosing what is greater. He says, when they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. In all of this, what Moses is looking to is himself. He says, Israel has this problem and I have the solution. I don't know that this is intentional. My guess is it's probably not. I think oftentimes when we live like this, when it, what's happening is it's, it can be ego or pride or false humility or whatever, but often it's kind of this gradual shift into it that we're not even conscious of, but yet is true. And that's what it seems Moses is doing. He's allowed Israel to dictate what he's doing. And now he's taken that upon himself and said, hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be this guy. I'm the guy that they have to turn to. He's not supposed to be the guy that decides every last little aspect. Not one person is supposed to do that. But Moses is looking to himself. And I think it feels like there's kind of this aspect that he has. It all rests on his shoulders. If he doesn't do everything Israel wants, it's all going to fall apart. If he doesn't answer all their problems, they're going to abandon God and leave God. And it's going to be his fault. And it's a, it's a trap that he's living in. It's a trap that we often live in, that it's all upon us, that, that, that we live in this idea that God is going to work through one individual. God's plan for his, his people, God's plan for the nation of Israel is greater than one person. And God's plan for his church is greater than one person. Moses can't be everything for every person. And you and I as individuals, we can as well. His design for this nation, his design now for the church is this, this group of people working together, coming together with different experiences and talents and skills and giftings, serving one another and serving the people around them. As we live on mission, we cannot live as individuals. We are to live as the church. God's greater plan than a one person doing it is to have the church as a whole. And he uses this analogy in, in the New Testament of our body, that we as the church are the body and Christ is the head and we are carrying out his mission and we're all different parts of the body, equally valuable with different skills and purposes, but all working together to advance the kingdom calling of spreading the gospel and loving one another. It's not on Moses and it's not on me and it's not on you as individuals. We need to see the value and allow God to work through the people around us, which sometimes means we just need to stand and get out of the way and let God be in control. And the last way we see that God is greater is a little bit farther down the line. Verse 23, if you do this, God will direct you. That the, the, the advice that Jethro gives Moses isn't just this human good, human advice. It's something deeper. It's advice that is coming from God. He's sharing, if you do this, all right, God will be with you. It's not just Moses' good idea. This is biblical, godly advice. And I think that's important that we are aware of where is our advice coming from? Where is our advice? Why does Moses listen so willingly to Jethro? One, he has the familial bond. He trusts him. He knows him. But I believe, too, what he sees before the advice 
is Jethro is a man pursuing God. He may not have it all figured out. There may be some confusion and he's greater than all the gods. But what he sees is Jethro is moving towards God. He's trusting God. So his advice is coming from the best place. There is a lot of advice in this world. There is a lot of people who will give you advice. There's a lot of so-called people who will give you so-called good advice. But are we getting the greatest advice? Because the greatest advice comes from the ultimate source of wisdom, which is God. And we have to be really picky and choosy about who we're listening to. And you do need people around you who can pour into, that you can listen, that you can trust to, who, who ultimately really, really serve the same master that you serve. Because the master that somebody serves is going to shape the advice that they give you. And if they're not serving God, whatever master they're serving is ultimately the end goal for that advice. And I just, I got to give like a little shameless plug right now. Um, you need people who will speak into your life like Jethro. You need them. That is God's design is for you to be in community, to have people who can speak into your life. Do you have those people? And, and if you don't, right? Or maybe if, even if you do, there's always room for more. Like we have at the church life groups, the idea is to put you in relationship with people who can, who can be this for you. If you're not in the life group, we're kicking it off. Please, please explore. Be willing to step into that. Get a little uncomfortable because God works through the people around you and you're missing out if you don't have that. Through all this, we see the greatness of God. We see how God is greater. He is ultimately the greatest source of guidance. And just go back to the first question. Who's leading you? Who's guiding you? Where are you getting good advice, good, good direction? If it's not coming from God, the greatest giver of that advice and direction, calling, whatever you want to call it in your life, you're missing out. I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sticking around today uh, for our transformational moment. Just kind of go back to this question of who is directing your life. Ultimately, what we see through the passage is God, uh, or at least it's kind of a call back for God to direct Moses in his life to be the director of Israel. Who is directing your life? Who are you getting your ultimate advice from? Is it God? And, and it really, I, I think a lot of times we'll... Like, I'm not looking for the answer, the church answer. I don't, this isn't like a test that you're going to be graded on. This is for self-reflection. Is, who is actually directing your life? And the way we truly evaluate, what evidence shows that this is true? What we saw with Jethro is that we could see how God was directing it. It was shaping really everything after that moment that Jethro does that we're aware of. We see the evidence in his life. So what evidence shows who is directing your life? Thank you guys. Have a great day.